Hello everybody, this is David. Welcome back to my channel. Well, this is our fifth video in the series, Seven Reasons Why I Believe the Bible is the Word of God. And this is video number three, or the third reason, should I say. Uh, this is the third reason why I believe the Bible is the Word of God. And that is the veracity of fulfilled prophecy in the Bible. Now, the word veracity means... Uh, accurate, honest and true. So we're going to have a look at three prophecies to check how accurate, how honest and how true they are. But before we do that, let's just um, say that the Bible is unique. Hundreds of years and in some cases uh, over a thousand years before certain events took place, the Bible made precise predictions concerning those events. And no other sacred book or holy book has dared or ventured to make such predictions. The Bible is the only book which has dared to stake its claim to uh, divinity or divine origin on the accuracy of its prophecies. If we have a look at the book of Isaiah chapter 41 verses 22 to 21 to 23, uh, where God challenges the idol gods of the heathen to predict future happenings, we read, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things that are to come show us the things that are to come thereafter that we may know that you are gods yes do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and behold it together now of course um, the idol gods were impotent in that matter they couldn't do it and in contrast to their impotency god declares his omnipotence in Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10 where he says declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient things times the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure and we'll find that the uh, fulfilled prophecies of scripture amply demonstrate the truth of this statement from God let me read it again declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and i will do all my good pleasure now it is to be regretted that uh, in these days the vast field of fulfilled prophecy is largely forsaken even by christians today and the enemy knows that there is he he here conclusive proof in in these um, uh, fulfilled prophecies there's divine proof sorry conclusive proof of the divine origin of the Bible and uh, high criticism uh, which is um, only unbelief in an ecclesiastical suit has set out to destroy these great prophetic scriptures. Now before we get into the three scriptures that I want to look at, I want to just go mention five rules by which the truthfulness and supernatural, supernaturalness of any prophecy can be demonstrated. And any prophecy can be tested by the application of the following five rules. So if you're ready for this, number one, anticipation. The prophecy must declare something concerning future events. It must be of such a nature that not only a lapse of time must take place between the giving of the prophecy and its fulfilment, but it also it must be fulfilled in such a way which precludes any possibility of the prophet himself making it happen. Number two, Revelation. That which is predicted must be of such an unveiling that no human foresight could have guessed it. 
it must be of such a kind that it could not possibly have been deduced from known facts and principles. And uh, precision, the prophecy, number three, precision, the prophecy must be definite and precise in its details. Now general statements may often give a remarkable forecast of events, but exact and precise predictions which forecast accurately even the smallest details preclude the utter impossibility of anything else but supernatural revelation. Number four, inspiration. The prophecy must take a claim that it is divine. Number five, realization. The prophecy must be fulfilled at such a time and in such a manner that the whole prediction is completely and unassailably realized. Now, if these rules are applied to the fulfilled prophecies of Scripture, it will be found that on every occasion these prophecies stand the test. So, there are, as I said, there are three uh, prophecies, uh, three areas actually uh, in prophecy. That is, prophecies about Christ, Jesus Christ himself, uh, prophecies about the Jewish people, and prophecies about the Gentile people, that is, you and I, if we're not Jewish. So, let's have a look at one regarding Jesus Christ himself, and we find this in Isaiah chapter 53, where we read, Who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. But he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When, he, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin... He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore, bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You know, even if this prophecy is brought down to the very last date to which the higher critics have assigned it, it was still uttered many hundreds of years before the birth 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, 600 years in, in fact. And even a casual examination of the precise details of the prophecy and their exact realisation in the sufferings of Christ cannot but impress the honest reader. Are you an honest reader? I do hope you are. No wonder such attempts have been made to explain away this prophecy. For example, the uh, sceptic Bolingbroke tried to tell us that Jesus, by a series of deliberate provocative actions, brought on his own crucifixion in order to, to give his disciples the triumph of an appeal to this old prophecy. Now, how ridiculous was that? The invincible power of fulfilled prophecy is demonstrated when unbelievers are compelled to invent absurdities in order to get around the force of its mighty appeal. Now, Jesus is not only predicted in direct prophecies, but in the characters, institutions, ceremonies, offerings and feasts of the Old Testament, which are also prophetical. We're doing a series on the Old Testament, the, the types and shadows that point to Christ that are in the Old Testament. And it's quite amazing, actually, because these types and shadows all point to Christ. As Dr. R. A. Torrey has well said, the modern critical theories regarding the construction of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy all go to pieces when considered in the light of the meaning of the types of the Old Testament. And he goes on to say, I have never known a destructive cricket, critic that knew anything to speak of regarding the types. One cannot study them thoroughly without being profoundly convinced that the real author of the Old Testament behind the human authors is God. End of quote. So that's one prophecy regarding Jesus Christ himself. Let's have a look at one regarding the Jewish people. And uh, the Jewish race is the living monument to every generation that the Bible is the book of God. Take, for example, the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, where we have predicted by Moses the, the tragic history of the rebellious Jewish nation. And we read in Deuteronomy 28, 49 to 53 and verse 68, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favour to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of your cattle, and the fruit of your land, until you are destroyed, which also shall not leave you either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy flocks, of thy sheep, until he has destroyed you. And he shall besiege you in all your gates, until your high and fence walls come down, wherein you trusted, throughout all your land. And he shall besiege you in all your gates, throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your own body the flesh of your sons and of your daughters, which the Lord your God has given you, in the siege and in the straightness, wherewith your enemies shall distress you. And the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships, by the way thereof I spoke unto you. You shall see it no more again, and you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So the Roman, here, Roman power is here clearly indicated by Moses, although that power had not yet come into being. Notice the mention of the eagle, the very symbol of imperial Rome. The invader 
was to be of a tongue or language unknown to the Jews. And history tells us that the Jews were ignorant of the Latin language. And the wars of the Jews with their many terrible sieges fulfil in every detail the awful predictions that are made here. The return of the Jews to Egypt as slaves whom no one wanted to purchase was also fully realised. Those Jews who did not perish in the destruction of Jerusalem, we're talking about AD 70 here, were shipped to Egypt. Their son were sent to the mines to labour constantly until they died. Others were sold into slavery. Josephus, the uh, Jewish historian, records that a hundred thousand slaves glutted or filled or overfilled the markets of Egypt. Hence the prophecy of Moses was fulfilled to its last detail, no man shall buy you. So we've seen two prophecies so far, prophecies, a prophecy regarding um, Jesus Christ himself and prophecy regarding the Jewish people. We're going to look at now uh, a prophecy regarding the Gentile nations and we're going to have a look at um, Daniel chapter 2. Now the book of Daniel is a fascinating book. It deserves a whole video or even a whole series of videos in and of itself. But what I'm just going to say is that many great prophecies of the Gentile nations lie scattered throughout the Old Testament. But this one, the great prophetic dream of uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, which I, I'm going to read these few verses. Daniel chapter 2 verses, and I, I, I recommend that you read Daniel's chapter 1, 2 and 3 for yourselves to get this it's quite fascinating and amazing but let me just read these few verses Daniel chapter 2 from the verse 31 you O king were watching and behold a great image this great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome this image's head was of fine gold its chest and arms of silver its belly and thighs of bronze its legs of iron its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the, from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a, ground, a great mountain and filled the whole earth. We're going to stop there. So here, the three great world empires, the Medo-Persian, the Greco-Macedonian and the Roman, which were to follow the Babylonian Empire, were clearly predicted. And the division of the Roman Empire was indicated by the two legs. While the rise of democracies, the rule of the people, was declared by the symbol of clay. Part of the iron was still to remain, however, so that today monarchies and republics exist side by side in the very territory once occupied by the Roman Empire. So, as we see, even after a short, brief consideration, of the field of fulfilled prophecy. The divinity or the divine origin of the Bible is remarkably demonstrated. Let me finish off by saying the inspired word, the Bible itself, and the incarnate word, which is Jesus Christ, can declare, as we read in John chapter 14, verse 29, and now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Will you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? So I want to thank you for joining me in this video. See you in the next one. Bye bye.